will hold your hand I've looked and now the coast is clear Let's sail to better lands Cause fear is just around the bend your friend but I won't I won't let him in no I won't I won't let him in you can have my shoulder dear I will hold your uh, Stop Hunger Now was founded in 1998 by a retired Methodist minister and a former Marine by the name of Ray Buchanan. Ray actually um, did some domestic hunger relief through an organization called the Society of St. Andrews. Um, in the 90s, he kind of decided that he wanted to take more of an international focus. So Stop Hunger Now was founded as um, kind of a gift and kind agency where we would take food donations and get them overseas into areas of chronic hunger. Back in 2006, we actually started our current meal packaging program which we run a volunteer program where we package a rice-based meal that has a soy ingredient, dehydrated vegetables, and a vitamin packet. Um, it's different from a canned food in that it's more of a casserole that has to be prepared. Basically, we prepare it in these bags. These bags then go overseas. Um, then you just put the meals themselves in boiling water for about 20 minutes, and it kind of forms a nice casserole-type dish. The meal was designed so it could fit into pretty much any culture where it needs to go. It's completely, it's a vegetarian base and then it has a roy, uh, rice and soy base in it too. The reason for this is just so we can send these meals anywhere in the world where there's a need for them. So we try to make it as bland as possible to make it fit into uh, any type of cultural restrictions that might be in place on the local community that receives the meal. We have a few, we have a rice distributor. Um, we we uh, purchased from a rice co-op called Rice Land in Arkansas. Um, then most of our other ingredients are grown in the United States. We work with a few, um, another organization called Outreach that helps us provide the other ingredients such as the vitamins. Um, we work with a vegetable producer as well. Um, so everything pretty much comes from different distributors here in the States. Um, each meal can be produced for 25 cents a serving. So one quarter feeds a kid for a day. Generally, the kids will get one serving of the meal when they come to school that day. Um, quite often, we do find that's the only meal that kid will receive in that given day, but um, at least they get that one hot meal when they come to school that day. The meals themselves, um, the vitamin packet in there is specifically engineered to meet the needs of children. Um, so we kind of focus on that to basically help support children's immune systems. And then also, since these meals are in schools, just putting something nutrition and nutritionally sound in their body so they can actually focus on their studies. Um, last year, we sent about 16 million meals overseas. Um, we have 11 branches, soon to be 13 across the United States. We send millions of meals overseas each and every year. Um, basically, it's one child at a time. We have a focus on school feeding programs just to give kids a reason to go to school. We find that often um, parents will do anything to get their kids meals, whether it be have them go out on the streets to beg or work in the fields to get that food. However, once you put food into schools, you see enrollments start to double and, and triple within these school populations. So then basically we find that kids come to school to get these meals and they get an education as a consequence. Then through education, you create a child that can then go and provide for themselves, which breaks that cycle of poverty 
and then world hunger kind of solves itself once you break that cycle of poverty. They feed them here with the food that Stop Hunger sent. The parents are at peace to send their children to school knowing that they will get something to eat. And it's very uh, obvious once the children eat and the joy and the contentment and the retention that they have, it has increased a lot because they have something on their tummy. We run a very strongly volunteer-based program. Um, here in the metro area in Atlanta, since we opened in September 2010, we've packaged about 1.5 million meals just through volunteer work. So here locally, we can get people involved by putting these meals together. We have what we call packaging events, where sometimes they're here at our office in Marietta, um, or we can even come outside to you. And basically, we bring all the equipment, all the ingredients, and we just kind of run a simple assembly line process where we package these meals together. Um, it's a lot of fun and it only takes about 30 to 40 people two hours to package 10,000 meals. So it's a very quick process, it's a lot of fun and just with a few people in two hours you can impact the lives of 10,000 kids. Basically our main thing is that hunger is just a very surmountable issue. All it takes is 25 cents to feed a kid for a day and that 25 cents is just pocket change just as Americans but it can go so far to really change the lives of a kid to help them rise above the circumstance they were born into and break that cycle of poverty. You know, in this economy, um, fundraising can somewhat be of a challenge, but when it's just one quarter, if me feeds one kid for a day, it's amazing just how, if you just dig through the, the cushions on your couch, how many kids you can feed with just what has fallen into the cracks in there. And then if you do something like give up Starbucks once a week, you give your $5 coffee, you just fed 20 kids by giving up that one coffee. Uh, earlier this year, we did launch a new website. It's uh, www.stophungernow.org. Um, if you go to this website, you can find out more about 
what we do across the entire country. And we also have um, international packaging locations. We actually run this exact same meal packaging program currently in South Africa. Also on there, you can just find some general resources about hunger information, links to the World Health Organization and their pages about world hunger to just kind of educate yourself about what the true face of hunger is on the international scale.
Well, we're standing here in the Atlanta Community Food Bank today in a beautiful facility that's about seven years old. But we actually started about 32 years ago uh, in the basement of a downtown church not far from Georgia State, St. Luke's Episcopal Church. I had just finished up as a student, as a graduate student here in Georgia, originally from North Carolina. Uh, but when I finished graduate school, like many students, I thought, what do I want to do with my life and how do I want to serve? I had determined that I wanted to have a service-oriented work and service-oriented life. So I first began just by working with homeless people back in the mid-70s. Uh, and we started a community kitchen feeding people. And over the next three or four years, we were actually feeding hundreds of people. It was the only place in town to eat if you were homeless in, in the mid-70s. And the idea was, let's get other congregations to open up their doors. So I went around town and promised everybody all the food they needed if they would help feed the hungry. And I was surprised a lot of them said, yes, if you'll bring us the food. The only problem is I didn't have the food. So, uh, you know, sometimes, and I think particularly as young people and as young students, you get an idea, you have to go out and try it out. You have to see if people are interested in it, and then you have to produce it. And that's exactly what happened here. I had to go out and find that food. Uh, so that was 1979. I started out with about 30 organizations. They were all congregations then. Uh, today we have over 700. So it's grown a lot through the years. Uh, you know, we actually have uh, pantries in universities now because there's a lot of students that are just getting by. They're working, they're trying to go to class. I know I put myself through college in undergraduate and graduate school. So that's, that's tough. You got to study and work at the same time. But I think it really puts us in good stead as we finish school because we have a strong work ethic. We get an idea of how the world works and you get a better idea of what you want to apply yourself to. Uh, our first year we distributed about 50,000 pounds. I do that in a day now. So you can see that it's grown a lot through the years. But uh, more times than not, things gradually grow and it becomes clear what the next steps are and it becomes clear who's going to step up and help you out. So in the beginning I had to go ask for help. I asked the grocery industry and the manufacturers. Uh, we only did a few food drives the first year. Today, you know, in, in the latter part of 2011, we're doing about 300 food drives around the city right now. Now, had we started with 300 food drives, I would have quit right away, first day, because I wouldn't have known how to do that. But I think the great thing, if you're an entrepreneur, if you have an idea and you want to try it out, is you start where you are with what you have, with the circle of friends that you have, and the time that you're given. And that's all we're really asked to do, is to do our best with what we have. That's the story of the food bank. The idea of a food bank was to help empower organizations and people that wanted to feed their neighbor. So the food bank really is a wholesaler. We don't serve individuals or individual families. If they come to us, we'll refer them to one of our member agencies. So if you're a person in need, you just tell us your zip code or where you live, we will find an organization near you. So the whole idea is that a neighbor helps a neighbor. It's not some organization far away that you have to go to and ask a stranger for help. Now, we have food banks around the state of Georgia, seven of them. We're building a new one up in Gainesville right now. We have over 2,500 organizations. And about 65, 70% of those are congregations. But they're the Union Mission and the Salvation Army and the St. Vincent de Paul and all the places that people would be familiar with and probably some that people aren't familiar with. If you go to our website, which is ACFB, stands for Atlanta Community Food Bank, acfb.org, you really can find, uh, we're, it's a website we're very proud of, you can find out how to get involved, you can sign up as a volunteer, you can make a donation online, you can hear about one of our seven programs. Not only do we distribute food, but we distribute school supplies, we help people with their taxes. We work with restaurants and caterers in picking up food. 
you know, I don't know if you can get through college without being a waiter at one point in your life. And, you know, if you've ever been a waiter in a restaurant, you see a lot of food gets thrown away. We figured out a way to capture that. So going to the website, I think you can really understand the story and the scope of the food bank. You know, something that I think is very important is from the very beginning of the food bank, it started with a group of three volunteers. I didn't draw a salary the first year and a half. I volunteered. Uh, so we have continued to organize the program using over a thousand volunteers a month. And I, I'm very proud to say that we have a lot of students from Georgia State. We have classes, we have individuals, we have uh, the different civic social clubs, fraternities, sororities, that kind of thing. Um, so it's a fun thing to come over here to Food Bank if you're with a group of people. You can come over in the evening, you can come over on the weekends. A lot of groups come over and volunteer from you know, six to nine and go out and maybe uh, have a beverage and a pizza and make it a social occasion. It's important, I think, if you're gonna be a volunteer is to feel comfortable with what you have to do to feel like you're making a difference, it's measurable, it's impactful, uh, and that you are involved in something that's bigger than you as an individual. Uh, you know, I think we, we all have that sense of wanting to make a difference. And I can tell you that every dollar donated to the food bank gets $8.24 worth of food out the door. Every volunteer does real work here. Uh, everybody who's involved is part of fulfilling our mission. So no matter who you are, no matter what you're studying, there's a way to help. And it makes us feel better, and oftentimes people are helping us get through school, and it's nice to turn around and help another person. So we welcome that partnership. We welcome the participation of students from Georgia State. Well, I'm uh, 56 years young. I served from 1973 to 1976 in the U.S. Army. And currently, I'm a homeless veteran. I uh, came down to Atlanta about four days ago to meet a friend of mine, and I haven't seen him or heard from him. He didn't meet me at the bus station, and so that's kind of the situation I'm in at present. Uh, 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 hoping to get into the uh, Veterans Hospital. I need some uh, medical work done. And that's what I'm working on right now. In fact, I was just on my way out to uh, uh, like a food, uh, you know, soup kitchen to eat some lunch. Uh, you know, there's uh, many, many homeless people and uh, many homeless veterans out here that are struggling to get by, and uh, we need all the help we can get. Well, uh, I, I think there's there's a lot of people that, that treat you with um, some sincerity and compassion, but the majority of people kind of. Uh, look down at you or snub their nose at you, you know, they uh, they don't have, and I can understand at some point, you know, the, well, why didn't you do something with your life or this or that, but you know, sometimes there are circumstances in your life that that, that happen that um, are ne necessarily in your control, uh, you know, and I'm not saying that that was such my case, but that happens a lot, you know, the biggest struggle I think is with your own self-esteem, is probably one of the biggest issues, so, you know, how you feel about yourself being in this position. Um, just compassion and kindness, I think, I mean, in my case, you know, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not necessarily looking for, to get any big handouts or anything, you know, we need, we need help. I mean, I've been trying to get out to the Veterans Hospital, and I'm not having much luck finding, uh, you know, bus fare or transportation out there, you know, uh, but just some compassion and kindness goes a long way with just the human spirit. started in November 23rd of 2000 and randomly um, I, I'm from New Jersey and I came down to work here for uh, a baseball player who was a Met and is now a Brave or was a Brave then he's retired now um, and I was here for Thanksgiving and was going to go home for Christmas and decided to serve with the Hosea Feed the Hungry that was the same year Hosea Williams died and they had an 
overwhelming amount of volunteers that offered to volunteer. Um, so I got rejected. I got rejected at the Salvation Army, got rejected at all the other ones. So a friend of my, um, my friend was with me and we both noticed the men and women that were um, in the entryways of businesses or in parking garages that weren't going to the various dinners. We thought, oh, maybe we'll just get some food at a gas station and hang out with them. And that day was really impacting, not for the food that was given, but for the conversation, even though I'm sure the food was needed and a good thing. Um, I was really impacted by the conversations that I had and I decided to go the next week, the next week, the next week. The men and women on the street, they're usually talked at or ignored. So for equal dialogue, um, that is very restoring of the dignity of a person. And that can go a long way in getting them to make life change on their own, not somebody doing something for them, but we're more, we walk alongside the men and women on the street um, to make those steps rather than um, focusing on meeting all their needs. We help them to make the steps so that they can meet their own needs. When we serve, we serve with, which means when we have a meal, we sit down with. Um, we try to do break away those us them lines and we do things with not for so we break bread together we share a Christmas meal together we share chili together we share hot cocoa lemonade together and that's how we try to bring dignity while meeting needs we don't come with an agenda our job is mainly to create space with them and when I talk more sports than I do anything else, um, more current events. If the if Georgia Tech wins, I talk. If Georgia State wins, I we're talking about those games. Um, the Falcons. We we talk more about sports and current events um, than anything else, and just have that common camaraderie as being Atlantans. Well, we don't preach. Um, if conversations come up of faith, it is natural conversations. Um, I don't believe in forcing anything, whether it is you need to be in this shelter, you need to be in this em employment assistance or matters of faith. I don't believe force is a part of dignity. So we allow what naturally happens in conversation to naturally happen. Where do you go when you feel tides on a part by all the well places you know you can keep it secret, never have to share. All oh, the time is a wasting, but I know you can face this. Keep on striving, love is gonna find a way, yeah. And know that tomorrow is gonna be a bright Tell me the truth Do you wake at night Paralyzed by all your cares Well, there's not just you The same goes for all of us It's the condition that we share Oh, the time is a wasting But I know that together we can face this Yeah, So just keep on I want to let y'all know, man, all's good with the world, man. Just be good to the world, the world be good to you. That's all I'm saying. Tomorrow is going to be the right Oh, yeah, yeah.
Well, Lazarus serves Atlanta in five different ways. We have our weekly ministry where teams of volunteers um, take a twice a month rotation on Tuesdays, Thursdays, and Sundays and make space with the homeless that are literally on the street. Our goal is to reach those that are not in programs, um, the under the overpassers, um, the ones in entryways of businesses. And we just make time with them. We hand out lemonade or hot cocoa, depending on the weather. And literally for an hour and a half or two hours, we just get to know them. And through that consistency, we're able to direct them to life change and you know, the long-term needs that they have. We have relationship, and this is the second way we serve to take, uh, the city, is we have relationships with all the other programs. We are constantly networking, so that way, when someone gets to that very brave choice of wanting to make those steps, we can able, we're able to point them in the right direction. Um, our third way of serving the city is that we offer education uh, for the homeless and for the general public. Uh, the general public is the engaging homelessness class where we teach people how to interact when you work, live, or go to school in the city with the homeless that you're seeing day to day. We also um, offer resume interview classes for the homeless so that they can have their best foot forward when they're job applying. Um, the fourth way we serve the city is through our large events. Um, we throw um, three huge parties for the homeless. We have Health Day, which is a health fair, a giant health fair that we are now partnering with Atlanta Mission in their green space. And we have everything um, from medical, which could be um, blood pressure check, flu shots, blood sugar check, hypertension check. I mean, it, the eye, eye care and eye, eye exams. Um, to dental, we had cleanings. Uh, Colgate came out and gave cleanings for the kids, which was awesome. Um, we have um, we have a mental, uh, mental health section with counselors and psychiatrists. We also have a clothing store, job prep section where they can get their resumes printed right there and work with um, professional executives so that they can have all that they need for the job hunt, including what available jobs are out there. Um, we also have a hygiene section where there are haircuts and manicures and pedicures. And we have um, entertainment, uh, and that's really important because we try not to have the event feel clinical. So we have karaoke and a dunk tank and a photo booth and just fun things. And of course, food and beverage and all that good stuff. And then our um, other events are, we do a Christmas dinner and our Christmas dinner this year is December 10th. And literally out on the street in the parking lot, we hold a massive Christmas dinner where volunteers and guests both eat. Again, we do things with, not for, so we break bread with our homeless friends. And um, it's just a beautiful celebration of the holiday season. I think it's the community feeling. Because everybody's eating together, it is just a community party where a lot of times in service, events, um, especially where there's feeding, um, and that's a term I don't even like, but it's commonly used, um, where dinner is served or lunch is served is better. Um, there is a very deep line of us and them. Often those events are there to make the servant feel good, but are, while meeting a need, and that is important and that is good, it's well-intentioned, often makes the person feel less than. So we really try to blur that line um, as with the Christmas dinner, with every event and everything we do. We also try to bring dignity by, by having real plates. Um, it, it is hundreds of plates, but ha actually eating a meal on a, an actual plate is a luxury for the men and women. We have candlelight. We try to make the atmosphere um, regal, if you will, while in a parking lot. Um, where And we go to them. We're not asking anybody to come to us. We bring everything to where they are at, which I think is also a wonderful thing because we're saying where you are is fine and where we are is fine, but we're coming to you. We throw a giant Super Bowl party outdoors where we broadcast the game and have a, um, a chili cook-off where volunteers, I mean, they're trying for a good month to get the perfect uh, recipe. There's a big hoopla if you're the chili cook-off winner. What I love about that is that the homeless usually get our leftover food in our expired cans. Um, with this, they are getting, I mean, people literally try for a month to get the best recipe. So they are getting the absolute best. And I love that aspect of it. And it's just a fun party. I mean, there is very little service in that. Um, 
very little service. It's not like you hand out food, really. Um, everybody just sits and roots on their favorite team um, and hopefully wins the chili cook-off. <laughs> because Georgia State is in the middle of Atlanta and surrounded by homeless in their day-to-day, -day, um, I would say in lieu of making any other kind of donations, to carry MARTA breeze passes or granola bars when you are coming across the same homeless day in, day out. So many students don't know what to do in that situation, but want to show kindness, and I recommend being prepared. The uh, struggling economy has made it tough for a lot of people to feed their families, and while schools offer free or reduced lunches during the week, those children may go hungry over the weekend. Good Day's Mark Teichner, though, reports a local church is stepping in to help out, which is great. Mark, good morning. It really is. It's a great program that these folks are doing, and it's called Snack Sacks for Kids. Uh, volunteers load up brown paper bags filled with healthy snacks and bring them to local schools where they're given out to needy children. Every Friday, this office at the Embry Hills United Methodist Church in Chambly turns into a beehive of activity. You're watching Snack Sacks for Kids in Action. Volunteers pack and then deliver close to 200 healthy snacks for needy children at local DeKalb County schools. Um, a few years ago, I attended a talk um, in down at the Capitol, actually, and one of the subjects was about poverty in Georgia in particular. And um, there were a lot of statistics thrown out there that people can go look up and find out all the time. I think that I was like everybody else there. I was really shocked at the number of poor people back, you know, and this was, I guess, 2000, maybe eight, um, who were in Georgia, homeless, who were without jobs, who were having trouble feeding their children. It was, it was just amazing and shocking. And I felt... Uh, completely incapable of doing anything about it, which is a really horrible way to feel. Um, I have six kids, and so I, I think I just quickly imagined how hard that would be to, to not have a home, not be able to feed my children. It was horrible. Um, and in the middle of all that, this minister started talking about his wife and how they brought groceries to the schools for local families. Um, and I, I don't know what happened, but that sort of sat in my head for months and months. And I thought about my school, and I talked to the, the school in my neighborhood. I talked to the principal and found out, yeah, there were kids in my school, my neighborhood school, who they knew were going hungry. They knew were coming to school, not eating over the weekend. Um, and I, I thought, I, we can do that. We can do something about that. Um, and at, at the time, I was chair of outreach at, here at our church. And so I started talking to the other people in outreach. And all along, I just started thinking. I looked into other programs. Um, that are that exist across the country that people do things trying to help and thought well I can you know maybe that will work and I discarded several different ones for different reasons um, and finally just sort of came up with this really simple plan and when I talked to out loud to people about it I didn't get wow that's ridiculous but oh oh how how would that work and just sort of tinkered with it in my head and then in finally an application until we came up with this really simple way to give kids a little extra food on the weekends. Um, yeah, the intention is to help children who are having meals at school. And for a lot of the families that the children need at school, um, all, that's all the help they need. They do the rest themselves. But there are some children who come back on Monday having eaten hardly at all over the weekend. Those are the ones we're trying to help. And we thought, well, if we give them a bag of healthy snacks, as much healthy as we can, but they're kid-friendly, um, That'll, got, that'll help them. It'll tide them over. It, because we don't, from week to week, it can change. Maybe one weekend they do well, they have more food. The next weekend they don't. So we looked at a lot of different possibilities and concerns. Um, from the child's point of view, we wanted the food to be food they would want. There's no point in giving it to them if they don't, they don't want to have it. We thought we could give them, um, and I said this in the other interview, we could give them a loaf of bread and a jar of peanut butter. But we also wanted them to, to want it. Um, we wanted them to feel cared for. Um, because the bottom line is still, we're a church, I'm a Christian, it's not enough to just hand you something. You're supposed to be caring and loving about it. So we wanted to do that. We wanted the food to be accessible so the child could feed themselves. Then we thought it needed to be non-perishable for a whole lot of reasons, but from a child's point of view, if they don't need it that weekend, they can have those snacks every day of the week when they get home from school if there's anything left. So there's a lot of those kind of things involved when we were thinking about it. 
we were looking at foods that um, were fairly nutritional, could be filling, could, could be enough food to kind of get through the weekend, but that a child would not feel that they needed to cook or even have utensils if they didn't want them. And I actually tried some of this out on my own kids to make sure. I was a little surprised. Um, I said, well, what would you do with this thing of applesauce? Mom, tear off the lids, it's a scoop. It's a scoop, you know, who knew? Um, when I thought of the, uh, about putting things like Chef Boyardee, the canned SpaghettiOs kind of thing in there, um, and I asked my kids, I'm like, yeah, but you know, you'd have to heat it up. And they're like, no, actually, we'll eat it cold. No macaroni and cheese from a box, you know, those, that didn't work. Um, condensed soup, you have to add water, you have to heat it, that didn't work. So yeah, there were things that we looked at and uh, talked about and considered before we, we came up with kind of the, the variety of things that go in the bag. Okay, um, to start with, part of our issue is that some of the food is donated. So we give people guidelines about what, what we would like to use, what we'd like to have them donated. So um, the way we have it set up, there are seven different bins, and then there's a junk bin, and things that I just really can't justify. They're too high in sugar, too high in fat, no nutritive value, but kids love it, go in that bin. So in a bag, they'll get maybe one item like that. The rest of it falls into a category that, in my mind, it is still okay. And one of the ways that I chose those things, um, I looked at a book called Eat This, Not That for Kids. And I looked up things and, and read about them and, you know, the, the nutritive value versus the sugar added and all that kind of thing. And so we tried to make good choices. And we're still trying to make things um, that are not... Um, that have decent nutri nutritive value, not particularly high in sugar, they're still kid friendly, but they also need to have a decent shelf life. So those are all things that we, we weigh in when we uh, figured out what things were gonna go in the bins. The schools initially send home um, a, a, a flyer that is a, is a form a parent can fill out, you know, read the flyer and say, look, this is being offered to the children in our school. If you're having trouble providing enough healthy food for your children over the weekend, send this flyer in and list all the names of the children in your household between the ages of two and fifth grade, because we deal with elementary school children and younger, but not infants. The food is not, you know, younger than, than, a, than a toddler age. So um, that, and then we'll send home a bag for every child in the household that falls in those categories. Um, I don't ever speak with the families myself. I know that the counselors do, and they get no notes and, and stuff. Um, we get thank you notes at different times of the school year, sometimes from the families, sometimes for the kids themselves. Um, I get, I, I hear, you know, third hand, second hand stories from usually the counselors or the principal or the teachers about things that the children say and things that the parents say. One of the thing I, things I found most heartening was early on, um, the first year uh, th with the school we were dealing with, um, the principal came to me and said, you need to go talk to the counselor. The counselor told me this story that a family came in and said, um, we need you to take our child off the snack sex list. And they said, of course, the counselor said, gosh, you know, is everything okay? Did you get something she didn't like? Is there a problem? No, no, no. Um, my husband got a job and we're doing fine. We don't need it anymore. So we want to make sure that, you know, there's another child out there who might need it. That's when people are responding the way we want them to. We, we hope that they feel cared for, not put down in any way. And we hope that they know that this isn't just a treat for kids, but it, it's help. And that if they don't need it, you know, please let us give it to somebody else. So I'm really aware of how the dignity can affect um, children and their families. So first of all, we limit it to elementary school children because their perception of that is different than it becomes even by sixth grade. So we limit it to, to elementary school children. Um, their perception of things is, is as it's presented to them. They don't usually take on something else unless they're made to see it. So we felt like if we gave them healthy, fun food that any child would want, that was a good thing. If we could give it to them in a package, like our brown paper bag, um, that is often decorated with stickers and markings and kids coloring on it and stuff like that, that it would look fun. Um, so that was really important too. And then the fact that it comes home and it's stapled shut. So they go to the counselor's office, they pick up their bag, and they're, in, they're said, this is just for you, it's not something for you to discuss with your classmates, you know, put it in your book bag and go home. Kids know what's going on, but it, it turns out, instead of it being something that they needed to worry about being made fun of, these kids are often perceived by the other children as getting something extra and special, and they don't know why. And so it's actually become almost, 
almost a reverse status symbol. This is fun stuff kids could want that any kid could go, you know, well, I'd like that. <laughs> so we hope that's part of them feeling cared for. Um, actually, the parents don't know where it's coming from. Okay. Yeah, that's part of it. I mean, if they ask specifically, they're told, but we give this without any expectation that they're gonna come to us um, and, and tell us thank you that they're gonna, that we expect them to show up at our church. None of that was part of it. This is us giving because we can. That's just, just the beginning of it. That's the beginning, the end of it, that's it. Um, as far as the volunteers go, that's been really fun. The, uh, matter of fact, right now in the other room, one of the volunteers is a friend of mine in my neighborhood who does not go to this church, who did this just because she thought it was a great idea and she's my friend. And so I have people like that. I do have lots of volunteers at our church and that's the mainstay, but we're not a budget item on our church. Everything that's given um, for, that's spent for this program is just, is given voluntarily. It's not a budget item. It doesn't come out of our church budget. Um, and so it's interesting to me how the money comes in. So I don't even know. Um, it goes straight to the church and they tell me what's there and you know what there is to spend. The volunteers themselves and the stuff that gets picked up, that comes everywhere. We have volunteers you know, regularly on, on Thursday afternoons and Friday mornings that's mostly church members, but we've had families who homeschool their children who heard about this project and thought it'd be a great way for their kids to, to participate in the world in a different way than they do in any of the other things they do. They know they're helping children, they're actually doing a job that any child can do, they feel good about it, um, and they know that it's helping another child. So we've had those kind of families. I've had, um, I went to a, a group that meets in a Quaker building that is a synagogue that doesn't have their own synagogue yet. And they packed snack sacks and brought all the stuff and you know all, all the actual items and I showed them how to do it and talked to them about it. I did that one time. I've taken it to high schools where they've been collecting for a month or more, collecting items. I bring the rest and the fresh fruit and they, they pack the bags and we staple them shut and they help me haul them back to the car. Um, I've had Boy Scout troops and Brownie groups. Um, it's been amazing. Any community group that wants to do it one time or every other, you know, I'll work with them and figure out how to get them there, take my stuff to them or bring their stuff here, whatever they want. Yeah. Well, what I did really early on, the part of figuring out that this would work was also really wanting to make something that other people anywhere could duplicate. So I, I created this blueprint and it's online, step by step. I think there are nine steps that pretty clearly tell you what to do. Um, and I also stay in contact with any group who starts one or wants to start one. I'll, I'll, you know, I invite them here to see it in action. I'll go to where they are to talk to them about it. I flew up to Ohio actually this summer to my parents' church um, and to kind of urge them on. They were wanting to start a group and I understand they're packing 200 bags a week. Um, so I think there are at least uh, five in Georgia and the other one in Ohio that are doing snack sacks for kids based on the program that we started and that we've been, you know, this is our fourth year. Um, so yeah, we, I've done a lot of that. And as far as people coming and helping, sure. Friday mornings, we're here. You might want to check the DeKalb County School calendar or email me or call me to make sure because sometimes the schedule changes a little bit. But Friday mornings, we're here at nine o'clock and we're usually done and out the door by 10 o'clock. Um, our church is www embryhillsumc.org. So if you go to that website and click on it and then find us under mission, Snack Sack shows up and there's the whole thing, including my contact information. I think I just want people to understand that it's really easy to look at the news, um, you know, talk to people, you know, be yourself really overwhelmed with things when they're going really badly and it's easy and understandable to feel like you can't do anything. So then you have to think as small as you can do and then do that. So if what you can do is show up someplace else where they're doing something, do that. That's enough.
Just...